Welcome to the Grace and Grit Podcast, made for women who want their healthiest years to be ahead of them, not behind them. Join your host, Courtney Townley, right now as she breaks down the fairy tale health story you have been chasing all of your life into sensible action steps and lasting change. Hello and welcome to the Grace and Grit Podcast. This is your host, Courtney Townley. As always, thanks a million times over for taking time to be here with me today. Ah, what a month it has been on the show. We have approached the theme modern day mental health from so many different angles. I have personally loved diving into this topic, and I sure hope that you, the listener, have been reaping a ton of value. Now, before I forget, I want to remind you that we have created a free roadmap in case you want our notes about the theme this month, or if you just really haven't had a chance to listen to all the episodes in this month's content, the roadmap will give you personal notes from me on this theme. It'll give you the biggest takeaways from the episodes. It'll give you contact information for all of our guests. And we even provided a little space at the bottom this month for additional resources on this topic. This is incredibly valuable. We put a lot of work into creating this for you. And I would love to know if you are finding these roadmaps helpful. We created the first one last month on the topic of discipline. And then this is our second one. You can get access to the roadmap by going to graceandgrit.com forward slash mental health roadmap. And once you register, you never need to register again. You will get all future roadmaps delivered to your inbox when they are ready. So if you have not had a chance to go back and listen to all the episodes, I just want to quickly do a little recap of where we have been this month. In episode 167, which started us off this month, We talked about why I chose the theme, Modern Day Mental Health, and I did a deep dive into the lifestyle factors that you have direct control over that either nourish or deplete the state of your mental health. And then in episode 168, I introduced three simple strategies that I teach all of my clients to help them better manage their mental landscape. In episode 169, I invited Dr. Sarah Sarkis onto the show, who did an amazing job talking about the courageous act of taking responsibility for your mental health. She introduced a lot of amazing topics. Two of the things that I loved the most about our conversation is that she talked about the importance of getting comfortable with ambiguity, and she also talked about the importance of developing emotional flexibility. And then last week, I had Dr. Veronica Valley on the show, who wrote an amazing book called Why You Drink and How to Stop. And she, of course, did an awesome job talking about just that, how we tend to often gravitate towards things that aren't so great for us in an effort to try to maybe avoid our emotional landscape or because we are, we're thinking that those things like alcohol, like food, are bringing so much benefit into our life when in actuality, in many ways, they're making life harder. So we talk specifically about alcohol in that episode. And I think it's a really important topic for everyone to listen to because alcohol is everywhere and everyone is being exposed to it daily. So maybe you don't have a challenge with alcohol, but maybe somebody in your life does. And in today's episode, I have invited Dr. Mary Ann Vandenbroek to the show, who is a mental health expert. And in this interview, she shares her personal struggles with her own mental health and what helped her to heal. Mary Ann Vandenbroek is PhD, is a licensed doctor and psychiatrist, Her decade of experience has taught her that everyone has a unique combination of strengths and personality, and she now helps women leverage that combination for more success doing what they love and do best. So without further ado, let's get this interview started. Dr. Marianne, thank you so much for coming on to the Grace and Grit podcast. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. Lots of fun. I would love for you to start off by just telling listeners a little bit about yourself and sort of your journey over the past few years and and really leading up to obviously what qualifies you to be talking about mental health, because I'm sure everyone's always curious about that. 
<laughs> Who is this person? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I am Dr. Marianne. I'll refer to myself as Marianne from now on. <laughs> and I'm actually a licensed MD and psychiatrist from the Netherlands. And we got talking actually because we met in a group for entrepreneurs because I did a pretty big career switch over the past couple of years. So I was working first for around 17 years in total. So like training and then working in hospitals and mental health facilities. And it was never quite a brilliant fit, if that makes sense. So I, I did like working with people and, and, you know, taking care of people. And I found health very interesting and mental health very interesting, but it was always revolving around what was wrong with those people. And well, they were obviously very sick because otherwise we wouldn't have to take care of them. And it was just an environment that I really didn't fit in either. And I just, I sort of kept going on and on because, you know, I was in this career and it, it was rewarding on, on some points and also felt like this obligation to, to help people until... Well, probably after that investment in education too, right? Definitely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. It was like, oh my God, I did all this work and I don't really like it, what to do. So yeah, what really happens, and I think many people may recognize this, is you just go on and you think, well, maybe the next pit will be better, right? Or maybe if I just switch environments or maybe if I just switch jobs and it will be better. Mm -hmm. Well, it never did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then at one point, so I was pregnant with my first child, a son, and I just kept feeling more and more miserable. And at first I thought, well, that makes sense because like we have to work really long hours and sort of my colleagues were getting a bit burned out and I didn't feel that well either. But I was like, yeah, it sort of makes sense until after I gave birth and then I just got worse and worse and worse and I just got so scared all the time. And I was so afraid that something would happen to my son if I were to put him down. So I was like up all night with him walking and just so scared. And then it turned out that I had a postpartum depression myself, actually. So yeah, that's almost like a really bad joke. Like the psychiatrist gets a depression, but that's mm -hmm. when sort of, yeah, the story, yeah, took its own turn because I, I couldn't keep up with it anymore. It was like, after that, I sort of really need to get really honest with myself and I needed to make some changes. And so that is when I decided that I needed to explore uh, careers outside um, the medical profession. So I tired of the hospital because I wanted to get better and I wanted to be like this really great mom for my son and I wanted to be healthy and happy again. And yeah, that is when I actually decided to finish my my whole training because like really long and <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> everything. Yes. And had my daughter in between actually. And then after I was completely finished, I quit. And I started my own business. So yeah, that's my story. I, well, I have to tell you, I have so much respect for that because I think that, you know, doing what feels right to you is such a big part of health. You know, yes. listening to our own inner knowing and, and taking risk, not really knowing how it's going to turn out on the other side. Because I, I see a lot of women creating a lot of unnecessary mental health challenges because they aren't willing to honor that part of their knowing. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I think, because that is what it was like for me for the longest time, like I felt really stuck. I felt like I didn't have any options because I'd been in this career for so long and I would be disappointing so many people. And I, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do if I wasn't going to be a doctor because I mean, that was what I was trained for my whole life, right? So yeah, I felt stuck for the longest time. So I can totally imagine that some people never make the change just because they feel like they can't. But yeah, you, you're depriving yourself of so much happiness and joy if, if you don't try. But it's really hard and I totally get it if people are so afraid to, to take that leap because I was pretty scared too. Do you remember like a pivotal moment where you decided like this is it? Like I need to decide to leave yes. the medical profession, even though it's been years of education and years of investment, like now is just the time. What was that moment for you? Well, it was two moments because <laughs> when I went back to work after I had my son, obviously I didn't go back to work full time right away because I was still recovering. Sure. And that was when I first thought I need to explore other options. And then sort of this little miracle in the shape of our daughter happened pretty unexpectedly. Pretty 
<laughs> she was a surprise. So, yes. Yeah, she was the most amazing surprise. And and to be quite honest, I mean, I'd been really sick after having my son. So she was a beautiful surprise because I'm not sure if I would have been brave enough to to actually make the decision to have a second baby if if it hadn't been sort of given to us this yeah. way. So we were really lucky, but then also plans needed to change again, basically, because, you know, I was sort of working my way towards, um, you know, I was writing blog posts and had this website and then I was like, okay, yeah, but I'm having this new baby now. So yeah, then there was actually this second point that I had to make that decision even closer to the end of my training. But when I came back after having my daughter, and fortunately I hadn't gotten ill the second time, I was like, yeah, I can't go on like this because now I have two healthy babies and they are like the most important thing to me in the world. And they need their mom to be happy and they need their mom to be there. And I was just, when I got home, I was completely exhausted and had no energy to play with them. And that's just not the kind of mom I wanted to be. So yeah. Yeah. That was a really big part of my decision, becoming a mom for the second time, for sure. What would you say to a woman who might be listening today, who is contemplating some really big move in their life? They're, they're gonna, they're, they know that a big decision needs to be made. Maybe it's in a relationship that they need to leave. Maybe it's a job they need to change. Maybe it's a difficult conversation that needs to be had. And there's just so much fear around it. Is there, a, yes. is there a piece of advice you have for her, for a woman that might be struggling with those things, knowing that there's a decision that needs to be made and she even knows what the decision is, but she- Yeah, still- that's the thing, right? We know deep inside. We and know. So what yes. I really, really learned from this is we're sort of taught not to listen to the inner voice and, and not to trust our, our gut or intuition, or at least I was, and I think many, many women- like working corporate or, or or in a relationship that's not really working, they've been taught not to listen to that nagging feeling. And I think like if you're listening right now and you're thinking this is me, then this might be your cue to actually start making some changes. And yes, it's completely, completely scary. But the funny thing is, or I don't know if it's funny, but like if you don't don't change anything, then you'll be exactly where you were like one year from now two years from now, 10 years from now. Yeah. Whereas if you do make the change, then that might be a positive thing. So like it's in our mind, right? It's it's the primitive part of our mind that's always trying to protect us from making a change. That is just evolutionary. It was the best thing to do the thing that everyone else was doing. And I don't know, your intuition is like the more mature part of you telling you, no, that's not what we're doing. We are going to make the change because then at least there's a chance that things will get better, even if it's so scary. But that's just like your brain protecting you from change and it's it's not real. Yeah, it's that lizard brain, that really old part of our brain that's yeah. really just concerned about survival. And it literally yes. sees change as a risk that is threatening your survival. Yes, exactly. That's exactly it. So that's going to promote like staying where you are, no matter how miserable that is, which is, I mean, it's kind of weird because it's even going to promote that if we're in circumstances that are like detrimental to our health. So yeah, I mean, we can honor that part of our brain. And that's what I always tell like everyone I work with too, like thank that part of your brain for trying to keep you safe. But then I also tell it like, but I have a better plan. And I've got this, like almost like a mom telling her her, her young child, because that is basically how her, that part of her brain works anyway. It's like a young child. So just tell it, thank you for trying to protect me, but I've got this, like I've got a plan and things can get better. So, you know, give me a chance to execute it and then we'll take it from there. So what changed for you? I mean, because I'm sure just knowing a little bit about you, doing a little research on you, you know, it seems like now you're really in work that you feel you were called to do, which I imagine has benefited your life in every way. Yes. (laughs) Fortunately, it has. (laughs) So you took this risk not knowing what was going to be on the other side of it, and yet you took action to change your story anyway because you knew what you were doing was not working. So you took that risk, and what did open up for you? 
So what happened is for me, I started looking into entrepreneurship and then like my dad's an entrepreneur, but he's like the very traditional with this big office and he's like an accountant. So that was my example. And I was like, hmm, that's not what I want either. So. <laughs> that's not going to help my mental health. Yeah. <laughs> I started researching. I was like, hmm, I'm quite different from my dad as well in many, many <laughs> things. So yeah, so I started sort of researching all the options and also talking to lots of people who had taken that leap and then also really looking into like sort of getting to know myself again, if that makes sense. Because yes. as definitely as women, when we grow up, we start building all these layers around ourselves to sort of protect ourselves and to fit in. And then at one point you, yeah, you need to make this decision to start shedding those layers again. And I really got to know myself again by, well, by sort of thinking about it, but also by doing like personality tests. And then what, what was a big game changer for me was actually looking into my strengths. Because then I realized like, okay, I have this set of strengths. It's, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm just really, really, really in the wrong environment to leverage my strengths. And the thing with strengths is if you're in the wrong environment, then they start to bug you. And it's like, it almost feels like, no, that can't be a strength because that is actually a horrible thing about me. But then as it turns out, like once I wasn't in like this really hierarchic environment that academic hospitals are, and I was working for myself, then it was suddenly something that I could leverage and then it worked out really well. So yeah, getting to know myself and understanding why I didn't fit in where I was working and what would work for me was really a big step for me to understand, well, I need to be my own boss. I need to have more freedom. And I do want to keep helping people. Like I never left that field, but I want to help people who are already gifted and talented and have so much potential to make the most of their lives instead of helping people who are really, really ill get just a little bit better and and using like medication and that sort of thing. Because that just really, it wasn't where I was leveraging my strengths. Like some people are really good at that, but it just wasn't me. Yeah. Well, I love the way you said that, that, that you really saw it as a journey of, of getting to know yourself and giving yourself yeah. permission to get to know yourself. It's interesting because I always joke with a lot of my clients that I lear- I've learned so much in the health and fitness industry, right? I've, I've acquired all this education to the point that I almost had to unlearn it <laughs> because I realized <laughs> yeah. that all of these things that the diet and fitness industry were teaching me you know, initially felt helpful. And then they just felt like a dead end. Like they weren't really sustainable. They weren't really promoting longevity. And I had to go through several years in my career where I was unlearning so much of the theory and techniques and strategies that had been kind of taught to me because they weren't really helpful for the long term. And the other thing that I always say to my clients, which I think is so applicable here, is that I really believe that health, mental health, physical health is a journey of self-discovery. Yes. <laughs> That's yes. really what it is. It's not a destination. It is a journey of self-discovery that will be ongoing for the rest of your for life. For sure. Yeah. We always joke about, and you probably do that too. It's like a spiral, right? Because I, I, oh, so often I have people coming to me and they say, yeah, I'm really struggling with this thing. And then I go like, yeah, yeah. So it sounds like we, maybe we should look into, well, whatever. And then they're like, no, 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 that can't be it because I've already looked into that. I've worked through that. And then I'm like, yep, (laughs) getting another layer. So like, it's never done. It's, it just comes back. Right. Well, and I find as humans, and maybe this is very women oriented as well. We kind of like the checkbox. We want someone (laughs) to tell us exactly the step to take that I can just tick the box and it'll all be good. But that's not really the, the, the strategy that we need to use to promote mental health and physical health, right? We really need to go in and get to know ourselves and be willing to mess up and try some things on and see if they work. And if they don't, we try again. It's not really as simple as checking a box. No. And it's just so personal, so deeply personal. So, I mean you've had a couple of podcasts already on the topic of mental health. And so some of the advice was more general and it was brilliant advice, but then always like apply it to your own personal situation. And what works for one person is like horrible for the next person. So, Which yeah, is why the dieting industry is such a catastrophe, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, but it's actually kind of horrible, right? That there's people saying like, oh yeah, that's this strategy and it's going to work for everyone because it worked for me. And then people yes. get like so disappointed in themselves. Like they're not disappointed in the person telling them that that is going to work for them. And then it doesn't. No, they feel like a failure because they tried something that wasn't for them. And it just breaks my heart because I mean, it's so hard to then try again, right? It's so true it's, and because they think that it defines them. They think there's something wrong with them when yes. in reality, there's something wrong with the strategy they were using. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that was also like the biggest takeaway from my own journey. Like I, for the longest time thought it was me. It was something wrong with me. And it turned out like I wasn't the best version of myself for sure in that time, like when I was still working in hospitals, but it wasn't because there was something inherently wrong with me. It was just because I was in the wrong place and it wasn't working for me personally. So that is like my biggest takeaway. Like it's not you, it's just needing to peel off some more layers to figure out what is the best place for you or the best decision for you because it's not what is going to work for everyone. Well, and how awesome that you were willing to look at your struggle with curiosity and ask yourself, like, where else might I fit a little bit better? Like, how else could I work out my career to feel more nourishing rather than depleting? And if you weren't willing to ask those questions or look at that, you know, which a lot of people aren't, they're so uncomfortable that they're afraid to look at the truth of their situation. But you had such a high level of self-awareness and you were willing to ask some uncomfortable questions of yourself, which really led you into a space of feeling like you're in such a better place. And, and I'm sure your family is benefiting and everyone around you, your clients are benefiting tremendously from you taking responsibility to nourish your mental health, which is really what you did. Yes, definitely. But I think that was also like the biggest reason. Like if I, if it would have been just me, yeah. then probably I would have have been that motivated, which sucks in a way. Like why can't we be motivated just to make ourselves happy? But <laughs> for me, yeah, it was the same way. Like it was it wasn't just me anymore. It was my husband, it was my children, it was my my clients back then and then now the new clients who I can really help so much better. So those were definitely my motivation too. I love it. So definitely pursuing work that was a better fit was part of your healing process. And what other things do you think are important for women to know on this topic of helping them to take responsibility for the state of their mental health? And I ask that to you specifically because I know I've read some of your articles that talk about the importance of sleep, the importance of controlling your negative self chatter. So will you speak to some of those things that also will help that recovery and healing process? Yes. So sleep is a big one. Yeah, huge. <laughs> and it's just oh, definitely like women who are working moms. Oh my God, we're so sleep deprived, aren't we? It's like, oh my gosh, yes. Everyone's exhausted all the time. Yeah. So for me, that that was a really big one. And, and so often it sort of feels like it's almost natural for the mom to be the most sleep deprived. I don't know how that works in your family, but (laughs) I think many women recognize this one and it's just so important. So yeah, don't tell yourself that you can get by on six hours of sleep because you can't. I mean, there's, there's always exceptions to the rule, but like the, the vast majority of us need seven to nine hours of sleep each and every night. And so definitely with lots of the women I work with, we do dedicate some time just for like very simple sleep rules. And then if that doesn't work, we definitely also use um, techniques like, for example, the emotional freedom techniques of tapping to fix that. And and sleeping alone, like if you were only sleeping six hours a night and you can increase that by one and a half hours or something, is going to change everything. Like life looks so different when you're sleeping well. For It really does. <laughs> I always joke, I mean, one of my sayings is that there's nothing that a good night's sleep can't help soften. No, but that's really true. And also like, oh, this is a big one too. So when you lay awake at night, I'm sure you recognize this and you start like you're laying awake and your mind starts racing and each and every problem seems completely insolvable, right? Like it's just impossible to solve problems at night. 
And still, we, we sort of let our brain do that. And so actually what's going on is that the, the chemistry in our brain is slightly different at night than it is during the day. So it's, it's just physically impossible to be a good problem solver at night. So that's what I really started telling myself. And, and it doesn't help right away, obviously. But I sort of tell myself now when I lie awake at night and I start worrying, I tell myself, well, now is not a good time to solve problems. It's simply impossible. So I need to stop doing that. That was also like a big, and it sounds silly maybe, but... No, it doesn't. I think that's important because some people, I mean, you do, you get going, you start thinking, and then you just take yourself down this dark hole of worry. And really, you're not solving anything. (laughs) No, it it makes zero sense. But at the moment it does. So you need to sort of train yourself during the day to remember this at night is is what I'm always trying to do. And it it really helped for me, to be quite honest. So that is a big one too. Well, obviously there's diet. Um... So I see so many women who are like working really hard and and they use like lots of coffee during the day and then they use like a glass of wine at night to wind down and they use sugar to stay up. And so what also really helped is just minding my diet more. And also that wasn't as easy as it sounds because I had like this big chocolate addiction. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, no, don't take away my chocolate. (laughs) Um, yeah, it really does help if you sort of leave out the stimulants much more because it sort of helps your brain to to start doing it on its own again. And it just it 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 makes you happier if you if you are able to to stay off it a bit more. And I'm I'm not promoting to like never have something no, of good. Of course. <laughs> yeah, but- it, it definitely helps if you're mindful of it. Yeah. And we do know that sugar definitely can disrupt the microbiome and there's so much connection between our brain health and mental health and our microbiome. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And that is something that it's, it's becoming more known, but still like many of my, my former colleagues are not even talking to their patients about diet and about the detrimental effects of sugar, where especially women are so good at sort of eating away their troubles, right? And I mean, I used to do it too. So, <laughs> and sometimes I still do. Like I'm, when I'm really, really stressed, I'm like, okay, I'm having that piece of chocolate now. Yeah. But it makes all the difference. Yeah, definitely for the microbiome. And that's just something that we're discovering more and more about. And it's, it's really important for, for the chemistry in our brain, for sure. Now, earlier you mentioned emotional freedom technique. Will you speak a little bit to what EFT is? Because I think a lot of um, listeners may not have ever heard of it before. Yes. So that's actually quite a brilliant technique and I really love it. (laughs) So one of the reasons also that I didn't really fit in in my old profession is that it was, so I was working in a hospital setting. So it's not the same for every psychiatrist, obviously, but especially in a hospital setting, it was really traditional medicine. And I've been looking more and more into Eastern medicine combined with Western medicine, because like sometimes you just need the medication and sometimes you need the Western techniques. But I mean, Eastern medicine has been there way longer than our Western medicine. So it must make some sense is what I thought. So I started looking into it and then finding the techniques that I would be allowed to use under my license, because that is also obviously important that they are tested techniques. And that is when I came across EFT or tapping. And I usually explain it like calling it acupuncture without the needles um, because you use the same energy systems that are flowing through your body. And what you do is you, you gently tap on it with your fingers using like special points and, and using a statement. So you do need to work with a professional. You can't do any harm if you do it yourself, but it's well, it works if you work it's with a technique. Professor, like, you need to understand the technique. Yeah. Yeah. You need to understand the technique and also like which statements work best and that sort of thing. But then it's like this really gentle technique and it helps you clear emotional blockages in your body. And when you do that, you sort of allow your body to, to heal whatever's going on. And it works for so many things. So it works for emotional issues. It, you, it works for physical issues as well, but it also works really well for things things like cravings and addictions and that sort of thing. And it's just, I mean, you can't do any harm. And um, I've cured a couple of patients already from, because I haven't been using it for really only for a few months. And I've cured a couple of patients of like really severe sleep problems already. And they've been struggling for years and years and using medication and like going from seeing doctor after doctor. So I'm really impressed with the method and it's really 
brilliant for so many things. And it's just such a beautiful example of holistic care, which is also why I really like it. So yeah, I'm, I could rave on about it for hours. <laughs> I love it. So will you, uh, do you have any maybe resources you would direct a cl- a somebody listening today who wants to find out a little bit more about EFT uh, where they... I don't know whether, whether it's a book or an article or, because I, I too agree that EFT is very powerful work and it's definitely worth people getting educated about. Yeah. So there's actually, I'm forgetting her name, but I'll give it to you after the show. So you can post it in the show notes probably. Sure. Um, Cause there's actually just a Ted talk that is brilliant and it's, it's brief and, and she just explains it beautifully Perfect. and, okay. and then people can sort of continue their research if they want to go in from there. So Great. yeah. I would we will start there. We will post that in the show notes for sure. So let's talk a little bit about the importance of creative expression and play and kind of doing work that lights you up in terms of mental health. Because again, I, I work with a lot of women. I know you do too. And it's very easy, especially as we get deeper into life. So as we get into our late 30s, 40s, 50s, life just starts to get more and more complicated Mm -hmm. in a lot of good ways, right? We have families, we've built careers, we own homes, we have, you know, there's just a lot more responsibility than there was in our 20s. And so I find a lot of women negotiating and compromising and rationalizing their way out of restoration and play and making time for creative expression. And I would argue that that stuff actually keeps us so healthy. And there's so much research that's starting to show this. I mean, there's, I keep reading articles about doctors in Europe that are now prescribing like dance classes and art classes and walks in nature to help heal their um, patients in terms of a lot of mental health issues. So what is your opinion on this? Yes. Well, I mean, I'm completely, yes, I completely agree. It's actually, so, well, there's, there's more and more research and still in many facilities, they're actually, because of money issues, they're sort of getting rid of that, those types of treatment, which is completely horrible because yeah, I've, I've seen it with many of my patients that sort of, so we had art therapy and like going outside for walks and sports. So even like, no matter how ill people were, like one of the first things they got to do is, is do some sports or go for a walk outside site and it just really helps if you're severe, severely ill but also like if you're just doing okay it, it can completely change things so for example if you have like very mild depression and that's actually quite common um, it can be solved just by walking walking for 30 minutes a day and and being outside is it can cure like all your problems so no medication needed no talk therapy or anything and there's also and and this is of course harder to prove with research because it's like it's a combination of so many factors but what i just see time and time again is when women start paying attention to what lights them up what brings them joy things start to change. That's also like, it ties back into your previous question. If, if women are like doubting what to do and they're stuck in this situation, that's not making them happy. Like taking the first step of starting to do something again that lights you up just for you can change everything. It changes your perspective. It changes like the chemicals in your body. It's just so important. And sometimes we're at this point where we can't even remember what lights us up, right? Yes. Um, So yeah, if you find yourself in those circumstances when you're like, hmm, I'm not sure what that would be for me, then that is definitely your cue to to start thinking about that again. And so my favorite type of talk therapy, if we are talking about therapy, is completely based on the fact that, sure, we have this healthy adult part of us that needs to make the day-to-day decisions and it needs to like mind our emotions like you talked about before on the podcast and it needs to watch out for all those nasty voices in our head. But then the other part of us that is of key importance to stay healthy is like our inner happy child. And that needs to be nourished just as much. And it needs to be able to come out and play too, because that is the only way to stay healthy if you're able to balance the two and not stay in the adult part of you all the time. Yeah, I love this. And this goes back to what we were saying earlier too, about how you don't really do your best thinking at night when you wake up and you're worried about all of life's problems. Like where do you normally get your best ideas? It's when you're restoring. It's when you're taking a shower. It's when you're walking your dog in the woods. It's when you're taking a dance class with your husband on a Saturday night. 
right? It's not when we're really hyper-focused on the problem. No, that's not how our brain works. Exactly. It, 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 it just can't find the solution. If we're, like, it's good to, to ponder on it and to, and to sort of get your brain going and think about it. Obviously not in the middle of the night, but <laughs> so then you need to let it go and sort of have your brain work out the solutions because that's also how our brain works. Like it has this filter. And once you've sort of told it what to look out for, you need to let the filter do its work because then it's going to be mindful of all the information it needs to work out the problem. And right. for that, you need to sort of give it a bit of a rest basically because otherwise it can't do that and sleep. So you become much more creative um, and a better problem solver when you have a good night's sleep. So yeah, we're tying that back in as well. Not to mention you're also a much more pleasant person to be around. <laughs> yep. <laughs> do it for I people. Know I am. Do That's for sure. Don't do it for yourself. <laughs> well, one other thing I want to ask you about, because this is something that comes up a lot. And again, I so, it, I so appreciate you, you kind of sharing your journey because I think it just drives the point home that mental health really should be a priority for everybody. Because here you are, right? A physician, a mental health expert who also found that by nourishing her own mental health, life opened up for you. But a lot of times improving our mental health does require taking risk it does require changing things in our life that are not working for us. And that means we have to be willing to risk failure, right? And this is where I, where I see a lot of my clients tripping up is they have this idea of doing everything perfectly in their head, to which I always remind them that they've really done nothing perfectly in their life to date because that's just not the way humans operate, right? We and also, perfect people are so boring. So boring and life is so <laughs> boring. It's so true. And, and so what, I guess my question is, do you have any pieces of advice for listeners about learning how to rumble with failure? Because rumble or failure is such a requirement of moving our life to higher ground and nourishing our mental health. I mean, it's just something that we're going to be confronted with many, many times in our life. Yes. I, I mean, that's a whole nother chapter, but I want to say at least two things about it for sure. sure. Yeah, yes, that's a big one too. Like, no, I used to right? be so scared of failure too. And oh, the longer you sort of try to avoid it, the scarier it becomes. Um, but I think the fear of failure also, it, it stems from that very scared part of our brain again, right? That we previously talked about because like when we were cavemen, then you couldn't feel because you would die. I mean, if you sort of thought, oh no, that's not a lion. And then it was, well, you would die. And so the funny thing is that for many women, that is what our brain thinks. So failure is the same as dying. And then obviously, like it's not, but that's just what our primitive brain thinks, sure. right? And then obviously you are not going to risk that. So first of all, it's, it's pretty much the same as with all the voices in your head that are sort of telling you not to do stuff is you thank it and you say, yeah, I know you're scared of me failing and you know what, it might just happen and then we will just need to get up and try again. And so that is, that is really when you do need to be that sensible adult and tell that, that childish part of your brain to... Well, to leave you alone, because <laughs> you're not going to die if you fail. Yeah, I always tell myself to like the thing that I just said, like, I find perfect people really boring, don't you? I mean, if you're, yeah. if you're having this conversation with this person who is only telling you about their perfect life and their perfect kids yeah. and their perfect house, I mean, yawn, that is just so boring. And then the other thing is that also we're just always holding ourselves to a different standard than we're holding everyone around us. I don't know if you recognize that, but oh yeah, that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, and then so what I often tell people as well is like, okay, cool. So that is the advice you're giving yourself. Now let's imagine it's your best friend telling you this. Would you? beat them up over failing? Would you tell them not to even try because they might fail? Or how about your children? Would you tell your eight-year-old, no, 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 don't try to do that yourself. Let mommy help you for the rest of your life because you may fail. Nope, you yeah. wouldn't. So don't hold yourself to that standard then because it just doesn't make any sense. It's so true. I love, I don't know if you follow Brene Brown at all, but she talks a lot about how you know, when we see vulnerability in someone else's life, like someone else risking failure and changing their life, we actually look at it as an act of courage. Yes. But when we look at our own vulnerability, we look at it with shame and like it's a terrible thing, which is insanity because that's not how we perceive it in other people. 
And the other thing I loved what you said about (laughs) perfection. It is, it's, it's, it's like moving through life, holding your breath. That's how, because I used to be like the queen of perfectionism and I still (laughs) rumble with it because I, I, it was a pattern in my life for so many years. I imagine that to some extent I'll always rumble with it. Yeah. Because every time like stress comes up, you'll just default to that. Right. And then you'll need to sort of tell yourself yourself around it. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. But I have to say like (laughs) the feeling of aiming for perfection is exhausting. You know, not only is it impossible, but then you're wasting all of this energy and valuable resources to try to achieve something that's literally impossible to achieve. So it's really, to me, just, it's, it's such a silly mission, really, at the end of the day. And you're right. It actually ends up creating a very boring life, not an exciting life. No, and I, I completely recognize that. If other people do it, but like, oh, that's so brave. And then we're, we're like, no, I could never imagine doing that myself. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, we don't think we're better than anyone else. So why would we think that we're worse than anything else? Why would our vulnerability be like totally repelling to people where we admire it and others? That's just a weird thing to do. But that again, it's a mature part of your brain who ne- that needs to remind the other part of your brain each time. And the other part of your brain, that is another important point to make. I think it's just faster because it's older. So it gets to you faster. So you're always like, the rest of your life, no matter how much Brene Brown you read, no matter how many times you tell yourself, like you're always going to have these voices in your head that are telling you that you should be ashamed of yourself or that you're not doing it the way you should be doing it. So it's it's very important to then turn to the more mature part of your brain and explain to yourself why that is not the case and why that's wrong. And also like I post reminders to myself everywhere. Like they're in my bathroom mirror, they're in my phone because it's just the only way to sort of beat your, your fast brain to it. Well, and it's such a unique part of being human. Like most animals do not have the ability, no animal has the ability to think about their thinking like we do. You know, we have a prefrontal cortex that allows us to kind of look at that, like you said, primitive brain to see how it's behaving and then choose, is that really what we want to do or not? And that, that is such a unique part of being human. Yeah, but the thun- funny thing is that we sort of end up, like we're looking at it and then we berate ourselves for it. Of course. <laughs> good thing. Oh, that's just that cute five-year-old brain of mine doing its thing again. Oh, well. <laughs> like, yeah, wouldn't it is- be cool if we could just say that? Like that, I love that because that is, it's, it can be that easy. Yes, it can be. I mean, it takes work. It always of takes course. work. But like the answer is not that complicated. It's actually quite simple. Yeah. The answers never are. I find the longer I live, <laughs> the more simple. Life the is actually really easy. <laughs> well, and the hard thing with that is, you know, simple is not always easy. So even exactly. though things are simple in nature and the answers are usually simple, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily easy to apply. No. And it also doesn't mean that we need to, like, we never stop working. I mean, right. it, it always takes me paying attention to these processes because if I stop paying attention for a while, then I default to my old ways as well. So it's, yeah, I, I love that. It's, it's simple, but it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, but that's great. But it can I, be fun. I mean, it can definitely be fun. It can be fun. Yeah. And we just have to, again, make an effort to make it so because it is a choice. It is a choice. So I have a question for you that I ask all of my guests and that is, the, the characteristics, of course, my business is called Grace and Grit. And when you think of the qualities of Grace and Grit, based on this discussion today, or even based on your own life, how do you define those two qualities and how have they helped you along your journey? Oh, I love the name of your podcast. So I'm not a native speaker. And so I came like, I'm, I'm originally, I speak Dutch. So when I first came across this, this phrase of grace, I was like, wow, we don't have a Dutch word for that, I think. And I thought it was just so beautiful to give yourself grace. And I think to me, that is all about what I was talking about earlier, where you look at yourself and and the way you just your brain does silly things sometimes with the same kindness and the same love as you would when it were a child or when it was your best friend so 
for me, grace is really about, about that part, um, about looking at yourself, well, with a smile, basically. And for me, yeah, the, the grit is definitely about working through the hard stuff, like the scary stuff. Yeah. I mean, if I were to stop doing all the things that scare me, then I would never get off this couch again. <laughs> um, yeah. right? we'd, I mean, both, we'd both be sitting on the couch. I, guess, I wouldn't be bothered <laughs> eating my chocolate bars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so for me, the grit is about that, like doing doing the stuff that feels hard and that feels scary because you know it will bring you joy. So not doing the part that feels hard and scary just because you need to do stuff that is hard and scary all the time, but really because some of that brings you joy. And and as more the more you do that, you, the more you're able to see which things are really worth your time and effort. So... I think those are the the two aspects of it for me. I love it. Well, this has been a really valuable conversation and I would love for you to take a minute to just let listeners know where they can find out more about you. And I also know that you have a self-knowledge cheat sheet that you were going to tell them about that they can register for. Yeah. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. I mean, I I love your podcast and I loved our conversation. Um, So I'm not going to spell my website name because it's my name and it's Dutch. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Um, (laughs) I'm on the page where this is posted. No problem. (laughs) But anyway, so um, I I work as a talent and mindset expert and um, I mainly work with female entrepreneurs, but definitely also with women who still work in, in corporate or in healthcare care but are considering to maybe do like a side business or to start their own business and what we really focus on is leveraging your strengths and that is both in your skills like things that come very natural to you because many women sort of forgot what that really is what really what their zone of genius is but then also in your personality so how do you leverage the things that you think that are actually things that you need to be ashamed of even sometimes Um, so that is the first focus and then the second focus is all about mindset because our brain is sort of built to keep us small and there are so many tricks to overcome that so we can live this grand life and make this world a better place. Um, So if that speaks to you, then I would love for you to take a look at the cheat sheet. So I made this, it's actually a short list of nine questions that are all about getting to know a little bit more about your strengths and your personality and your purpose um, to really get you thinking. Um, So it's a free download and um, yeah, it can give you so much insight if you're sort of either struggling to change some stuff, but also if you're like, well, I'm doing pretty good, but I could always do better. Or I really would love to know what makes me so unique and so special. Because if there's one thing I learned from all my years of experience is that everyone has this unique combination of strengths and personality. And it's just my biggest joy to, to show them to you because I mean, what an awesome job, Marianne. Like that's I know. A I'm the luckiest person in the world. Sometimes I'm like, I, I shouldn't tell people about it because then everyone wants to do it. <laughs> that is when you know you're in your zone of genius, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's fantastic. So I will also post the link to that cheat sheet on yes, the website awesome. where this awesome. is found. So thank you again so much for your time and energy. Um, again, super valuable information. And I just really appreciate you sharing your journey because I think that that, you know, we have to normalize the conversation around mental health. Everybody struggles with it at, with, you know, to some degree in their life and perhaps throughout your whole life because a lot of mental health challenges are coming from you know, the lack of skills we have to navigate life's challenges. And if we can talk about it more and we can encourage each other to build those skills, it really does nothing but help promote mental health in all of us. Yeah. And support each other, right? Yes. Um, we don't know that you're suffering. We can't support you. And chances are that people would love to support you if you are. So yeah, I love that you're doing this. And thank you so much for having me and for having this conversation. Thank you for listening to the Grace and Grit podcast. It is time to mend the fabric of the female health story. And it starts with you taking radical responsibility for your own self-care. You are worth the effort. And with a little grace and grit, anything is possible.